connaissances, connaissances recherches, recherche, sciences, des sciences, mathématiques, mathématiques théorie, physique, philosophie, philosophie conférences, archéologie, nature. nature. Thank you very much for uh, being here and thanks for inviting me. I'm actually going to start by talking more broadly about uh, how we got involved in using voter campaigns, give you some uh, previous, some insights from some previous work we've done and then come to the specific Right to Information Act based work that we did with SNS. Um, all the work I'm going to talk, today, uh, talk about today is joined with many people including Abhijit who is here in the audience. And Really what motivated us to start working on this was a question you of, a point you often hear raised in many public forums, this question of whether poor countries can cope with development, sorry, with, de with democracy. Uh, development, hopefully they can. <laughs> so over the last half century, we've seen a very significant rise in democratization of low income countries. And a lot of policy pressure saying that democracy is the way governance should occur in low-income countries. So if you just look at the map, this is what it looked like in 1960. So red is authoritarian and dark blue is democratic. So if you look in 1960, most of the developing world, uh, with a few exceptions, India being one of them, was uh, authoritarian or had some form of non-democratic government structure. By 1990, this had begun changing most significantly in Latin America. So most of Latin America had moved from having authoritarian regimes to some kind of democratic regime. And then if you look by 2005, pretty much uh, the red spots are few. There is quite a lot of it still in sub-Saharan Africa. But there's been increasing pressure to move towards some kind of electoral accountability. So even in China, which is perhaps one of the more extreme examples of um, non-democratic rule, there has been a high rise in democracy at the local government level, and this is seen as uh, important in policy circles, both within China and outside. But at the same time, if I can now figure out how to go back. Yeah. In the same time as democratization has risen, there's been a widespread recognition of the fact that having democratic institutions often is not sufficient for good governance. Um, you're going to see a number of discussions on service delivery of different kinds uh, from developing countries, many of which are democratic. And in many of these cases, we find very low levels of government performance. And so an open question remains is, can democracy be made to perform better? Is there any way in which the poor can actually be empowered by these institutions? And this really is the question that has motivated a large series of work that we have been doing in India. India, I'd argue, for many reasons, is a good testing ground. Perhaps the two most relevant reasons are, first, it's been democratic for a long time. It became independent in uh, 1947. Since 1950, it's had regular elections except for two years. It's also perhaps a textbook case of service delivery gone wrong in a developing country. We have a number of books and papers that now very uh, eloquently make the point that the state has in many ways failed to provide basic services to the poor. In terms of uh, democracy, as I said, it's been there throughout, and if you look at turnout or political participation, it's been stable. It's not very high and it's not very low. It's, uh, it's roughly between 60 to 65 percent from the start, and we see not much change in this. On the other hand, there have been a couple of other trends in, in um, the functioning of the democracy which have been seen as more concerning. The first one, and I'm going to spend some time talking about it, has been the rise of uh, ethnic politics in some parts of the country. So one of the good things that has happened in the Indian democracy is uh, increased political competition. It moved from ha being a one-party system to now having many different parties that fight competitive elections. 
But many people have noted the fact that this period has also seen an increasing number of parties that campaign not on providing services to the poor, but on uh, ethnic, in the Indian case, this is largely caste loyalty. So vote for this party because we represent you. The second trend that has happened is there's been, a, appears to have been an increase in the number of legislators who have poor, who have poor qualifications of many dimensions, including having criminal charges. So the last uh, national election was just uh, completed two weeks ago, and while many have heralded it as a great sign of stability that the same government got elected again uh, with a stronger majority, others have noticed that even this election saw an increase in the number of legislators with a criminal record. So if you compare the 2009 results, the most recent national elections, with the one in 2004, um, India in total has, I think, 548 legislators. The number of legislators with a criminal record continue to arise. And those who have a serious criminal record, so these are charges that carry imprisonment of five years or more, also increased from 55 to 72 percent, 72 people. And all of this, of course, is against the background that service delivery in India seems to uh, be poor and remains poor on many counts. So I think it's an important question to ask in this setting is, can democracy deliver at all? Or should we have to look for solutions, either direct community mobilization or other forms of privatizing service delivery that might work in a country where, which has had a stable democracy for a very long amount of time? So what I want to talk about today is two sets of uh, campaigns that we have evaluated. I'm going to mostly spend time on the second set, which is on providing information, and links up, I think, quite nicely with some of the themes that Yaakov was talking about. But I don't want to start talking about um, simpler campaigns where all you try to do is persuade people. So is it the case that one can just persuade uh, voters to take more seriously the idea that democracy can actually be a tool for accountability? And here I'm going to talk about some results we have from voter campaigns that we conducted in India's largest state, Uttar Pradesh, which has a population of 165 million, and if it was a country on its own, I think it would be the world's seventh or eighth largest country. And then the second campaign is a campaign where we actually provide, very similar to what Yaakov was talking about, report cards or actual information on legislative performance to voters and see whether that influences how they uh, choose candidates. And this is from the last state election in India's capital, um, Delhi. So let me start by talking about some results from the rural campaign. And the underlying motivation for this was really what I had st started by talking about was the increased prevalence of ethnic politics in many parts of India, including the state that we work in, Uttar Pradesh. And to put this in a broader context, if you look at just international figures, so if you look, for instance, at Freedom House Reports, which compiles reports on governance for every country annually, roughly a third of the world's democracies have political parties that, you, that are based on ethnic lines. And if you look in a number of um, poor countries, this number is not only high, but there is a, there is a significant premium that an ethnic party has in winning elections if it belongs to the group representing the majority. This has led some to argue that in developing countries, elections are often just a racial census. Now, why should we care about this? It may simply be that this is a good thing. Different ethnic groups have different preferences, and if all that elections was doing was deciding how to divide up a pie of resources, perhaps, um, we are talking about distribution of, pub, of transfers between different groups, but there's nothing bad per se. However, in previous work um, that I've done with Abhijit, we've argued that if, if politics is doing two things, one is just redistributing resources between groups, but it's also providing competent um, legislators, then the fact that you have people choosing to put more emphasis on ethnic preferences can actually lead to a reduction in the competence of the legislators you elect. And this will happen for two reasons. 
The first is that as ethnicity becomes more important, the likelihood that the dominant group candidate wins will go up. And then the competence threshold or the quality threshold at which he or she will win will go down because what's more important is which ethnic group that they represent. So the question that we started our campaign with is, is to what extent is ethnic voting actually reflective of not a very serious thought process about why ethnicity is the right marker, but perhaps just reflects the lack of information, or maybe even more strikingly, just the fact that people don't recognize that the electoral system can actually affect change. If you have a lot of cynicism about uh, what legislators can do, or whether they'll even care about you, then perhaps it just makes sense to vote on the dimension that's the most salient to you every day, which is in a lot of parts of rural India, ethnicity. So, to put it in different words, what we were interested in asking, is there a case in which you can actually persuade voters to vote for better candidates? And we did this through two campaigns. We did it indirectly by having a campaign where we, pers we the message was don't vote on caste, vote on quality. And then we did it directly by having a different campaign where the message was directly vote against corruption, vote for clean candidates. So these results, uh, these campaigns took place before um, the last uh, state election in Uttar Pradesh. Uh, voter campaigns per se have become a pretty important form of civic mobilization across India and many other developing countries. So it was not difficult for us to uh, identify NGOs who were already carrying out this work and persuade them that it was perhaps important for them to get some feedback on how successful their, can uh, their campaigns were and therefore agree to take part in a randomized uh, field experiment where we would choose a certain set of villages and then in a, in a random sample of them provide um, either the caste campaign, which was to say don't vote on caste lines, or the corruption campaign, which was vote for quality, vote against corruption. Now, in these areas where we worked, there is significant variation in um, criminality of candidates. So across these 18 jurisdictions, in half of them, none of the major parties fielded uh, candidates who had criminal charges against them. But in the other half, the candidates fielded, some fraction of them had criminal charges. So this was a setting in which we had at least one good measure of what you might think of as quality, which is the likelihood that, the, that a candidate had been charged with a serious criminal, um, a serious crime. So as I said, we had two treatments. In one set of villages, uh, candidates, were, uh, the NGO gave the message that development issues affects everyone in the village, not just members of one caste. So vote on development issues, don't vote on caste lines. In the second set of villages, the campaign was corrupt politicians steal money set aside for development funds. They don't do anything for you. Vote for clean politicians that care about your development needs. So in both of them, there was a positive message, which was vote on development issues. And then there was a message of what not to vote on the basis of. In one case, we said, don't vote on caste. And in the other one, don't vote for corrupt candidates. The NGO. In a village that got the campaign, the NGO would have a team of two people who would spend an entire day, and they would conduct the campaign in many forms. Some of it was door-to-door -door campaigning, where you would go to houses and inform people of uh, these messages. Then there was actually, at the end of the school day, there was a children's rally that the school children carried out. And then at the end of the day, we had a puppet show. And this puppet show had a theme of either the caste campaign or the corruption campaign. And after the puppet show, there was a village meeting. So here's a photograph of a village meeting. This was actually a village meeting for women. So at some point during the day, we also always had a separate village meeting for women, because in many of these areas, um, women and men did not socialize. We also used posters. So here's an example of a caste campaign. There are um, individuals from different religions uh, who are trying to get your vote. And in the end, there's a clean politician who has no religious connotations. 
and the poster tells you vote for uh, vote don't vote on religious lines ethnic lines vote for uh, development this was the corruption campaign uh, which is the difference between a politician who is thinking about money, who is going to potentially buy a vote, versus a clean politician who is thinking about development. So what do we find? Let me say going in, I certainly was skeptical of finding any effect. Elections are big business in India. At the same time that we were campaigning, the average political party had big film stars from Bombay campaigning for them. So. The idea that we would actually have any effect by spending one day in a village with a message that's quite weak, it's not giving you a lot of hard information, should have an effect, seemed, would seem to us ex ante that this may not happen. However, what we found was that both campaigns had an important effect first in just encouraging turnout. So if you look at the caste campaign um, and we break it by gender, we see an increase in turnout among both men and women. Women are significantly less likely to vote, but they respond. And in both cases, the effect was particularly pronounced when we look at those constituencies where at least one candidate had a serious crime charge, or what in India is known as a heinous cr uh, criminal charge. So if you look at the third set of, res uh, third set of bars, the blue line is for the control villages where no campaign was held. 64% of the villagers came out to vote. The green bar is those villages where um, the treatment happened. And we find that male voter turnout increased from 64 to 74% in those constituencies where at least one candidate had a criminal charge. And we find similar effect, similarly large effects for women. In the corruption campaign, overall, we don't find an effect on turnout. It seems like overall, when we look at the results, not much changed. However, when we compare across uh, constituencies that had some criminal standing, we find a very strong turnout effect there. So this is the first sign we have that the importance of a campaign seems to depend a bit on how villagers are able to interpret it. In the case of the caste campaign, it was a very clear message. Uh, voting on caste is something that every political party comes and asks you to do. And here's an NGO coming and say, do the opposite. On the corruption campaign, we were not giving them much information. We were simply saying, vote for clean candidates. But we didn't tell them who the clean candidates were. In areas where there were clear signs of um, low quality candidates, which were candidates who were clearly involved in criminal activities, there was some interpretation of this message which, turned, which was interpreted as increased turnout. And so we see an effect in those, will, in those areas that more people turned out. The second thing that we see is uh, not only did people turn out, but the basis on which they vote can be influenced. Now here, in order to look at whether people changed, whether they vote on the basis of caste, we can't rely on polling station data because that's anonymous. So we conducted a survey after the elections were completed. And we look at that. We see that um, the likelihood that you vote for the party that represents your caste went down from 57% to 52%. Moreover, if this caste preferred candidate had a criminal record, that's really where you see the effect. So if, the, if your candidate was someone who was a criminal, then your, cost different, your, your vote share goes down a lot. And the second fact is something that we can look at in the electoral data. So in the electoral data, we can simply ask, does the fact um, that you had a caste campaign reduce the vote share of candidates who had a criminal record? And we find that, it, yes, it does. There's a significant decline in the vote share of candidates who had a criminal record from 32% to 28%. On the other hand, the corruption campaign, even though it mobilized voters in constituencies where criminals were standing for election, we find no significant change in the vote share of candidates with a criminal record or of the candidates who journal journalists had identified before the election as being the most corrupt. If anything, and this is in general true, 
Uh, and this is not affected by the campaign. This is just in general a fact that candidates who have criminal records on average seem to do better in elections, um, which is something that was reflected even in the trend I started off with. So how do we interpret these results? So it appears that if you, if you prime voters, sorry, not candidates to vote, priming voters to vote on an issue that is related to what they have been doing right now, you can see an effect. So in an in a area where every party is coming in and saying, vote for us because we, are, we represent your ethnic group, a message about voting on, not voting on that grounds and voting for quality has an effect. However, a very bland message that goes and says, don't vote on corruption has no effect. Now, we think that there are two possible reasons for this. The first is that people do care about corruption, but this information was too hard to interpret. There was too little information that we were giving them and we were simply told them, don't vote on corruption. The second, which we can't test, is that politicians reacted. That in areas where you saw more of a corruption campaign, politicians reacted by going and being more proactive in how they campaign. So since we can't disentangle between these two messages, we turn to a next um, campaign, which is to provide hard information, to actually see when we make it easier for people to identify uh, who has done uh, well in, in their performance and who hasn't, do we find an effect? And that's the work that we did with SNS that I wanted to talk about now. So as Esther mentioned, uh, a few years ago, India passed right to information laws, which makes it possible to get objective information on legislative performance. So we worked with SNS, and Anjali will talk about more about the process and the incredible amount of work that they did to get this data. And we worked with them to provide this information um, to a set of low-income voters. So we were particularly interested in asking, how does information affect the poor who really rely upon the state for public goods and private goods? We did this in three phases. So again, this was a campaign that was done as a field experiment. So we chose uh, 200 slums. Out of these 200 slums, by lottery, we selected 100 slums where we provided the campaign, and 100 slums were left unaffected. After the elections were completed, we collected uh, both survey data and data from the polling stations that was associated with these slums in order to look at their effect. So the first phase of this program was just a door-to-door -door campaign where people were given information about the rights and responsibilities of legislators. What is it that a legislator should do? In the second phase, uh, we worked with SNS to prepare report cards on the performance of the legislator, which included both how they worked in committees and how they spent discretionary funds. We also collected data on the qualifications of the major candidates, which included their criminal record, um, their educational qualifications, and their assets. And then we, we provided this information in a newspaper. So over a week, every day, this newspaper would carry the report cards of three constituencies. And then these newspapers in the selected treatment areas, we provided um, free distribution. So we ensured that every, newspaper, every household in our treatment area got a free copy of the newspaper in the morning on their doorstep. And then finally, uh, in the third phase, the NGO workers went back to these areas and conducted a focus group to discuss the findings, to discuss what the newspaper article said. So that's um, just a photograph from a slum in Delhi. That's an NGO worker conducting the first phase, which is a door-to-door -door campaign in which information is being provided on the rights and responsibilities. That's the second phase. That's a cutting from the newspaper. So if you look at the first column, that's for uh, the pink is for one constituency. The top part describes the performance of the legislator. So at the start, it tells you how often he or she attended um, the parliament, how often she asked questions. Then it describes how they're spending, how they spent the money, that the discretionary funds that they get. 
So every legislator gets uh, 20 million rupees a year, which they can spend uh, on any uh, public goods in, the, in their constituency. And this describes how they, pr how they provided different goods, including water, sewage, drainage, and so on. And then below that, it, again, it provides uh, explicit information on constituency-specific committees that the legislator should set up. The two, one most important one is a committee where uh, citizens can come and complain about uh, how well the food, uh, the, the food uh, fair price shop in the area is working. So providing subsidized uh, food grain is one of the main ways in which the government tries to uh, provide transfers to the poor. And there's a lot of discussion about how hard it is to get uh, this food and how much bribery there is in a system. So one of the main things that the legislator, one of the important things that the legislator is supposed to do is to set up a ration vigilance committee that actually uh, takes in complaints from consumers on how well this is working. And then finally, below it, we then provide candidate information. So those are, the, those are the three candidates from the three major parties. And for each candidate, we provide information on whether they had a criminal charges against them, what their educational qualifications were, and what their assets were as they disclosed at the time of uh, filing their candidacy. So, a lot of our results are going to depend on using electoral data from polling stations. And this is important because this is um, unlike survey data, where one might be concerned that people uh, give us the answers that they think we want to hear. This actually captures who they voted for. So the first thing that we see, uh, which is similar to what we saw in UP, is voter campaigns are an important way of mobilizing voters. So the rate of turnout or participation in the elections went up from 56% in the slums where we provided no treatment to 60% in the areas where we provided this treatment. The second thing that we find, and this, is, this seems to be uh, very parallel to what we saw in the rural areas, is that voters do not like candidates with criminal charges. People often say, um, that candidates with criminal charges, maybe they're the ones who can fight the case for the constituency, bring home public goods. We see no evidence of that. So here's a result for Congress party, which is the party that uh, was the incumbent party and actually won the elections. Uh, in red is, the, is, the, is, a, is a Congress candidate who had um, a criminal record, and in blue is a Congress candidate who didn't have a criminal record. So the first two bar charts show you in the area where there was no campaign. As I said, uh, in general, candidates with criminal records seem to do slightly better. So in areas where there was no campaign, someone, a Congress candidate with a criminal record got 48% of the vote, and someone who had no violent uh, crime record got uh, 46%. Now if you look at the area where there was treatment, this is reversed. A candidate a Congress candidate who does not have a criminal record now gets 50%, and someone who has a violent crime record got 43%. This is for candidates coming from the same party. So this seems clear evidence that people do not see criminality as something that benefits them. So even if we just looked at the first uh, graph, which is the kind of graph that you hear very often in newspapers, that they would say, oh, look at the poor. The poor like uh, criminals. They give them 48% of the vote, and they give someone without a criminal record 46%. But that's exactly why just looking at um, the statistics is misleading. And one of the great advantages of having done an experimental study is that we can say when people ex know um, the criminal record, they react, and they, they react to elect uh, more honest, less criminal uh, politicians. Now, the next question, which I think is the big question when we think about whether democracy can deliver development, is what do people care about when they vote? Is it the ca case that they just care about uh, private transfers? Do they care about public goods? Do they care about development? So in a survey that we did after the elections, we asked uh, voters, what, are, what, what, is the, what was the most important uh, reason for your vote? 
And what you see that the two reasons that are, and they could give multiple choices. The two reasons that were the most important was first was price rise, and the second was local development. The other issues such as corruption, crime issues, and terrorism are relatively low. The Delhi elections occurred four days after the terrorist attack in Bombay. So a number of people had said that the entire election would be determined by a response to uh, terrorism. But as you can see, it did not make terrorism uh, a very important issue in the minds of voters. They still saw price rise and local development as the two most important issues. Now, a second thing that's interesting is once you take the two issues that are the most important, there's a lot of variation in how much it matters. So we were working in 10 constituencies. In these 10 constituencies, if we simply look at how much they cared about local development, which is in blue, and how much they cared about price rise, which is in red, um, in the last constituency, for instance, 90% of the respondents said that they cared about price rise and only 33% said that they cared about local development. On the other hand, if you look at another constituency um, in the middle, that's where it's exactly reversed. 93% care about development and a much lower fraction care about price rise. So I think what is clear and is correct is that is people care about different things. Not everyone cares equally about development. Not everyone cares equally about price rise. But these were the two most important issues. Now, once we start looking at the results on what kind of information people reacted to, one way we are going to distinguish between the results is, is by asking, did you live in a constituency which cared a lot about price rise, or did you live in a constituency where people cared a lot about local development? And what is to us is striking is that inf different information mattered in those two areas. So when we look at information on whether your legislator had formed and attended the committee that looks after fair price shops or ration shops, we find that good incumbents benefited. So um, the blue line is for uh, incumbent who formed a ration committee. So people like them everywhere, so even in the control groups. But this, the extent to which they like someone who formed a ration committee increases and this difference is significant in uh, treatment areas. However, this effect only exists in those constituencies where price rise was relatively important. So this is consistent with the fact that if you care a lot about price rise, you care a lot about how the fair price shops work where you get subsidized food. The second thing we look at is spending choices. So this is just to give you an idea about the average spending uh, by the incumbents. So I'm sorry, it's very small, the numbers are bottom, but let me just tell you that on average, the first bar is on roads. So the thing that most legislators spend money on is roads. After that is drains. Then the next largest one is parks. And then community hall, sewage. Water had a different category, so you shouldn't look at this here because for water they get a separate fund. But basically, the first and most striking fact about this is that on average, once we add across all these categories, the average legislator spends only half the amount of money they are allocated. Uh, so the, 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 probably the most important sign of quality of a legislator is do they actually bother to spend the money? So spending the money is a bit uh, complicated. You have to... Um, put in pieces of paper to the municipal corporation who will then implement the public goods. So if you don't really care about your constituency, the easiest thing for you to do is not spend the money. And after five years, when the next election comes, if you have not spent the money, the money just goes back to um, the finance, the exchequer. So your constituency really loses this money. So on average, the average legislator is simply not spending um, half the amount of money that they could. So they get 20 million uh, rupees a year. On average, they, have, uh, they, ha they get 1 billion over five years. The average incumbent is not spending half of that. And I think the most striking sign, therefore, of performance is just how much money are they spending. And then there's the second issue of what your preferences are on categories. 
So what we find is that incumbents who we report were spending more do benefit in terms of their vote share, but this effect is only exists in uh, constituencies that prioritize development. So in constituencies that cared a lot about price rise, you face no penalty for not spending this money. Interestingly, and that we find that not all kinds of spendings are rewarded. And I'm going to close in some sense by just showing you the chart of which types of spending are rewarded and which are not. And then Anjali, I think, will, when she talks about um, this from SNS's perspective, will give some insights on why certain categories mattered and some did not. This is an area where we are still working to understand how we should interpret differences in what matters. So the, the, the light blue lines are less significant, but the main thing that you see is that roads, which is the category on which there was the most spending, their additional spending is not preferred by, by, um, by voters. So, so it's, I think that's significant at 15%, so not very significant, but you get no benefit for spending on roads. The main place where you, sp you benefit from spending is on drains and on community halls, and the main place where you get penalized for spending is on parks and sewage. And Anjali will uh, give some insight on this distribution. So let me conclude by saying that I think when Jakob uh, spoke, he put up in some sense what's often known as the accountability triangle or quadrangle now about the different ways in which citizens can get good services. Once you introduce democratic forms of service delivery, I think that one of the more important accountability tools is voting. And there's a lot of discussion about whether this is an appropriate accountability tool in developing countries. One reason people often say is that the poor can be bought more easily in elections. What we find in the evidence is that that's not correct. Poor care a lot about service delivery. And voting often is arguably an easier mechanism to use than trying to um, get a bureaucrat to react. You don't have to go to four offices, file, uh, file lots of paperwork. You simply go to the ballot box and vote. However, at the same time, um, the poor and probably more generally most people in democracies don't have very good information on service delivery. And that is an important dimension on which policy can probably react. So let me stop here. Thank you, Rohini. Uh, thank you for having me here. And as Rohini mentioned, uh, we worked closely with JPAL before the Delhi Legislative Assembly elections. Um, and I thought I'd start by giving you a bit of a background to all this work that we've been doing. Um, a lot of you might be aware, in India we've had a, a system or a culture where there's not too much transparency in the functioning of the government. So there's typically a culture of secrecy that has existed in the functioning of the government, and it's been aided and abetted by the Official Secrets Act of 1923. So although we got independence in the year 1947, but for reasons best known to uh, government, uh, they haven't repealed this law. And uh, although the right to information is enshrined in the Indian Constitution, but as a common citizen, it's been almost impossible to get information from the government on anything, including expenditure of public funds by the government. Very typically, if one goes to a government official or a government representative and asks for any kind of information, they would refer to the Official Secrets Act and say, well, I could be penalized under this act if I share information with you. So uh, we've had a regime where uh, you know, things have happened in a fairly non-transparent manner. And the result has been what Rohini talked about, so I won't go into great detail, but governance has been marked by uh, misappropriation of funds. There's been rampant corruption. Uh, public services haven't really reached intended beneficiaries. Uh, we've had misuse of power and authority at all levels of government, which is true for the executive, the judiciary, and the legislature. In the early 1990s, however, there was a movement, a people's movement, that began in the country in a state called Rajasthan, where people started demanding that a right to information legislation or an access to information legislation be put in place, which would actually guarantee them the right to information which is enshrined in the Constitution. Um, in the year 2005, um, 
at the result of a, a very large national movement was that we got a right to information law. It's, one of, it's considered one of the most progressive laws anywhere in the world, and it covers all arms of the government, the executive, the judiciary, and the legislature. It guarantees citizens the right to access any information held by the government, barring a few uh, uh, things which have been exempted under the law, but those are fairly stringent exemptions. Information has to be provided within 30 days, so there's a very clear time frame within which information is to be provided. There is a provision for two appeals, including an independent um, appeal mechanism should information not be provided under the law. So uh, this, this was extremely important because um, uh, in some cases where we had state legislations uh, on the right to information, it was noticed that when people didn't get information, uh, there was only one appeal mechanism which was within the department, housed within the department, and that was usually ineffective in getting people the information. So there's an independent information commission that has been set up both at the center and at the state levels to ensure that people get information if they're denied it from the departments. Uh, there's also a penalty um, in case information is denied, and the penalty is to be imposed directly on the public information officer or the government official who's um, denying people the information. So it's a, it's a fairly robust law, um, fairly nascent. It's, it was passed only in the year 2005. This is a little bit of a background on the group that I work with, Satak Nagdik Sangathan. We were set up in 2003, not affiliated to or supported by any political party, and the aim was really to, to promote transparency, accountability in government functioning. Our strategy has been to build capacities of people to access their right to information, to use their right to information, and access their rights and entitlements from the government. Um, a lot of places, what was really the problem was that people didn't really know what entitlements were due to them. So for example, Rohini mentioned about uh, ration shops, where people are supposed to get subsidized food grains, but people wouldn't have any information on their ration shops, or the records of the ration shops were, were not available to people. The result was that because of this lack of transparency, there would be a lot of corruption and pilferage of ration. And we essentially have been, our strategy has been to help people understand the right to information, to use the act and the law to demand uh, information from the government and act, use that information to access their entitlements and legal, uh, legal entitlements and rights. We work primarily in slum communities in Delhi. And uh, since 2005, our work has been focused on political accountability. Uh, perhaps one of the reasons is that although the entire government functioning has been garbed in a, uh, it has been um, non-transparent, but perhaps the most powerful section has been the legislature, the, the elected representatives, and it's probably been the most difficult and challenging task to access information on them. Uh, in fact, when we used to hold trainings and uh, you know, meetings in the communities, we realized that suddenly before elections, people would stop coming for our meetings. And you know, when, we found out, when we asked them why, they would tell us that we've been informed that our slums, which are illegal settlements, are going to be evicted and we are going to be thrown out of our houses. So we helped people find RTI applications and in which they found out uh, the, list, sorry, the list of uh, slums which were due for demolition. And uh, the result was the, the response to the RTI application showed that none of the slums where we worked were actually up on that list. So when people tried to find out where those rumors were emanating from, they realized that it was really informers or people working for political parties and candidates who were responsible for sort of playing on the fears of eviction of the slum dwellers and spreading these misinformation um, campaigns and rumors about eviction of slums and telling people that if you vote me into power, then I could perhaps save your slum from eviction. So there was... You know, when people got this information, there was naturally a lot of agitation, and they said that we would like to get information on the functioning of our elected representatives. You know, in meetings, people started talking about how little information they actually have on what their elected representatives do, what, their polit what the politicians do once they're voted into power. There was constantly talk about how elected representatives came to them only at the time of elections, but after that, they were not... Uh, to be seen for five years. It was only after five years that they would come to them again. And, uh, and, false, prom and you know, 
false promises were rampant, so people were promised everything, but then the politicians would just disappear, and there was absolutely no way to hold them accountable. So in fact, um, one interesting thing that people mentioned to us that was that they were very interested in getting information on elected representatives because they found them far more accessible than government officials. They said that while government officials who work in departments, um, you know, if they go to them, they, they don't easily talk to them. But because elected representatives need their votes, they're far more accessible and open to talking to people. But usually they sort of get away with false promises. So they said that we, if we have information on our elected representatives, we would find it a lot more um, a lot more useful and we'd be able to tie them down to their promises of development for communities. Talking a little bit about the campaign that uh, we did um, before the Delhi legislative elections, uh, Delhi assembly elections, um, uh, people in our community meetings where we work, people talked about the absence of information on roles and responsibilities of MLAs. They said that we have no idea on what exactly are the roles that these and functions that these people are supposed to perform. Yes, we do know they're supposed to represent us, but how do they go about doing that? What are their exact roles? What are the tools available to them? We have no information on them. Uh, people said that once, like I mentioned, MLAs were elected, they had no information on what the MLA was doing. So uh, as a first step in the campaign, we filed uh, right to information applications and helped people file right to information applications, asking for the roles and responsibilities, the functions of MLAs. And interestingly, the response that we received was that there are no stated roles and responsibilities of MLAs in, in Delhi. Now, I mean, we found that extremely surprising. So we filed another right to information application in which we said that, can you share with us the material that, that you give to newly elected MLAs? That, that surely should tell them what their job is. But we were told that we only inform them of their perks and salaries, and we don't talk about their job responsibilities in the orientation. So uh, we, were, we, we were left to set up a, a small group within SNS, which comprised of lawyers and some of us, who looked at the Constitution, People's Representation Act, and various rules and laws, and culled out the information on roles and functions of uh, MLAs. We discussed these widely in our community meetings. These are broadly the roles and responsibilities that we, uh, we, uh, we got there. First, of course, is in the Legislative Assembly. They're responsible for making laws and policies and raising questions to uh, ensure that government service delivery works well and the government, the executive works well. The second is, like Rohini mentioned, there's, uh, there are certain funds at the disposal of uh, MLAs. These are discretionary funds, and uh, they're under two schemes. One is the Local Area Development Scheme, and the other is the Delhi Water Board, the Jal Board Priority Fund. So under the local area development scheme, each MLA gets 20 million rupees to spend on the local area needs of people. They're supposed to ask people what their needs are, what their problems are, and address those problems using these funds. And the water problems are supposed to be managed using the Delhi Water uh, Board Priority Fund that they have of 5 million rupees every year. Uh, uh, finally, this, the function of executive oversight, and really one of the most important instruments for that is that the government has set up various committees, uh, where, which are essentially vigilance committees, of which MLAs are chairpersons or members of. And on these committees, they're supposed to convene the meetings and discuss problems that are, uh, that are there in the functioning of the executive and resolve those problems. We shared this information on roles and responsibilities with people, and, and there was a great deal of interest because people said that they had absolutely no idea that their members of Legislative Assembly got any funds whatsoever. In fact, they said that whenever we go to our MLA, we are told that I don't have any funds, so I can't really help you. They also said that uh, you know, they had no idea of the existence of um, any of the committees. So, uh, in fact, a lot of people came up to us and said that when we didn't get our ration supplies and we went to our MLA, the MLA actually told them that he's not a ration department official and had no, no role in correcting the problem and actually asked them to go to the ration department. So when people got to know that there are all these committees, there's the police committee, and of course uh, there are a lot of police excesses in uh, slum settlements, 
Um, people were extremely interested in knowing what are the sort of uh, things that their MLA has done in the past five years. It's a five-year term. So they wanted to get information on how their MLA performed on each of, again, in relation to each of the roles and responsibilities. So we filed over 60 applications uh, in the Delhi government to access information on all MLAs in Delhi. There are 70 MLAs in Delhi. The reason we accessed information on all MLAs was that we didn't want to appear to be party uh, to be partisan and uh, uh, the areas that we were working in Delhi there was largely one political party that was in, in power. So we accessed information on all uh, MLAs across 70 constituencies of Delhi. Uh, it took us over a year to collect the information. So um, even like, like we heard from one of the speakers before, uh, before us in the case of Uganda, uh, we, we do have a right to information legislation, but it's still not easy to access information using that legislation. There is still a lot of um, sort of holding back and the, the culture of secrecy will, is, is still pretty prevalent. It took us over a year and um, a lot of people, especially those from low income communities who were seeking the information were even threatened by the government officials. They said, you know how powerful the MLAs are. Your slums could be evicted, your ration cards could be taken away from you. But people persisted and, and, I, and uh, the, the result was that we did get information. However, the information we obtained was extremely difficult to understand. A, it was in English, which is not really the language that most people living in low-income communities understand. Uh, even those of us who understand English, uh, it was in an extremely technical language. So when we got the records, there was, you know, we, we really didn't know what to do with them. They were extremely in a very mystified state. We took the help of uh, engineers in the municipality, retired engineers who were sympathetic to the work that we were doing, to actually demystify the information and get that information into some shape which could be understood by people. The performance of MLAs in Delhi, um, this, these are some of the statistics that I've, uh, I've put up there. Uh, in the year 2007, the Delhi Legislative Assembly met, uh, met only 18 times, so on, uh, only on 18 days they conducted business. Uh, out of the 70 MLAs in Delhi, 38 MLAs never raised a single question in the Assembly. So uh, in the year 2007, 38 MLAs were completely silent. 53 MLAs um, on, the, on the expenditure of the local area development funds, 53 MLAs did not allocate all the development funds available to them. So like Rohini said, they didn't bother to actually even spend the funds that they could have allocated for development needs of the people. Um, what we haven't got here is that uh, the data showed where we actually shared it with people um, in community meetings, the data showed that a lot of the funds were spent on non-priority items. So uh, in one of the con constituencies where we work, uh, people have this ho a huge problem of water scarcity, where uh, women have to queue for hours to get drinking water. And the expenditure of the local area development fund by the MLA was primarily on constructing fountains and parks, So, uh, which could probably explain why people weren't very happy to see expenditure on parks, uh, which Rohini talked about. So there was, there was this huge mismatch. And people said that when they went to their MLA in this water scarce constituency, the MLA would say, I have no funds to spend to give you water and uh, to get water to, to your community. And then uh, they realized that the, the funds were actually being spent on constructing fountains and parks. Um, in 43 constituencies, uh, the information on committees showed that uh, in, in out of the 70 constituencies, in 43 constituencies, no meeting of the Ration Vigilance Committee was held in 2008, which for the whole year there was no meeting held at all. In fact, of these 43 constituencies, we have informal information to indicate that in most of them, the committee was never formed at all. Uh, of the nine districts into which Delhi is divided, each district is supposed to have a district grievance redressal committee, which essentially is supposed to look at the problems of water, sanitation, power supply to people. And only in one district did we find uh, that the committee had actually been constituted. With all of this information, we sort of went to the communities and uh, we started talking to people about the performance of their elected, uh, of their MLAs. We realized that we probably needed some sort of a mechanism to get the information out to people in a format that they would understand. 
and uh, we consulted widely with people. One of the things which everybody seemed to understand was report cards, because they said that all our children, most of the children study in schools, and the concept of their performance um, you know, um, communicated to them in, in the form of a report card was very useful. So we, we developed report cards, and uh, the report cards essentially provided a snapshot of the performance of an individual MLA. So for each MLA in Delhi, we, uh, we uh, made report cards in relation to their stated roles and responsibilities. Um, uh, Rohini showed us this sli uh, one slide. Yeah, this is... This is the report card of two MLAs in Delhi, and uh, this was carried by uh, Hindustan, which is a national daily, and uh, it, it essentially gives the parameters that Rohini talked about. So in the Legislative Assembly, what was the attendance, how many times did they attend, how many questions did they ask, um, how did they spend their local area funds? This actually gives the local area funds have been divided uh, into, um, uh, into categories. So there's water, there's roads, um, as, as we saw in Rohini's slides. Uh, there's information on how, uh, if they attended the committees, because we asked for uh, the minutes of the committee uh, meetings, uh, if they attended the committee meetings. And of course, we gave information on the criminal and uh, the educational backgrounds of the candidates. These report cards were disseminated through community meetings. We had focus group discussions. We had role plays. We tied up with NGOs across Delhi. As part of the JPAL um, study, we tied up with 15 NGOs where um, trainings were held on the roles and responsibilities of MLAs. They were given information on the performance of their MLAs um, uh, to be distributed in the, in the uh, treatment areas. Uh, there was, of course, also great interest in the media to sort of put out this kind of objective information on performance of elected representatives. So we tied up uh, with Hindustan, we tied up with um, the Times of India, which is the English uh, National Daily, and a couple of other places, uh, news channels, to dis disseminate information on uh, the performance of elected representatives. Rohini already talked about the results, so I'm not are going to dwell too long on this slide, but some of the other impacts and, uh, which we saw in the areas where this information was disseminated was that there was clearly a, a raised consciousness and there was a, a, an increased awareness about, about the roles of elected representatives. And I think uh, the relevance of elected representatives and their relevance in people's life is extremely useful for people to, uh, to go and vote uh, in the elections. So prob this is possibly one of the reasons why we see uh, uh, in the results that there has been a 4% increase in voter turnout where people got information on their elected representatives. The problem in India is that, uh, as we were discussing today, that this, the state is slowly receding and it's, and it's in increasingly people find uh, their elected representatives less and less relevant. So when people got, got this sort of objective information, the relevance of uh, elected representatives, uh, there's an increased awareness about it. And of course, the need to monitor the functioning. So when people got this sort of information on how poorly the performance had been, uh, there has been a great deal of interest in monitoring and getting information on a regular basis on the functioning of these elected representatives. Um, the report cards, also this information served as a tool for demanding accountability. So in a lot of the slum areas, uh, in the treatment slum areas um, and in, in some other slums where we work, people actually caught hold of the candidates when they came to ask them for votes. So instead of garlanding them, which is the usual site during elections in India, this time they actually asked them, how are you going to spend your local area development funds? And are you actually going to attend committee meetings and make sure we get our ration supplies? So there was a changed sort of a discourse uh, that one saw. Uh, information even now is being used by people to engage with their MLAs and ask them to, sp to spend fu their funds on people's needs to take up people's issues. And of course, there's been a pressure that automatically gets built by information being in the public domain. So for example, uh, both the newspaper Hindustan and uh, SNS, we got phone calls from MLAs saying, had we known that this sort of information is going to, put in, going to be put out in the public domain, we would have attended assembly a lot more or we would have actually constituted, constituted the, um, uh, the committees in our areas. So there's a, there's a natural pressure that's getting built for better performance and greater accountability. The research um, results that Rohini just shared with us 
um, are, are likely to be extremely valuable for us. Because looking ahead, the couple of things that we're planning to do, one of course is we intend to carry on doing this report card exercise. Uh, even after the Delhi state elections, uh, there were parliamentary elections in the country. And we again tied up with Hindustan and other newspapers to put out report cards on the functioning of members of parliament. Um, we are of course also very conscious of the fact that it's completely impractical to expect a billion Indians to file RTI applications every time they want to find out what their elected representative is doing. So one thing that we intend to do is to lobby with the government to ensure that information on the functioning of elected representatives is put in the public domain. So we are hoping that this kind of information which links performance to, um, to all the factors that we saw is likely to be, to be a very useful peg for us to, to talk to the government and push for that sort of proactive disclosure. Um, also, uh, interactions between elected representatives and citizens have been completely absent. There are no mechanisms for consulting, um, elected rep for, uh, consulting uh, citizens by elected representatives. Uh, the kind of graph that uh, Rohini showed us in which uh, each kind of spending uh, people react to it differently is likely to help us push for these kind of interactions because if it, it completely makes the whole, um, a whole paradigm not non-confrontational because if elected representatives understand that this is what is going to be appreciated by their electorate and there's going to be votes that they're going to see at the end of it, then they are likely to be more to be incentivized to actually interact with citizens. And of course, um, in a context uh, where, like Rohini mentioned, um, ethnic votes and, you know, there's a lot of uh, voting on the basis of caste, um, uh, these sort of uh, studies and the result of this kind of research is very valuable to actually link performance, good performance to winnability or getting votes. So this is where I'll end. Thank you.